whilst the title of this presentation talks about FinTrack regulated sectors, many of the risk mitigation steps and the controls that we're going to be talking about can really be applied into any risk management framework or in any jurisdiction. As a way of introduction, as Andrea has uh, has mentioned, my name is Ian Messenger. I am the Director of Anti-Money Laundering at Ontario Lottery and Gaming, the uh, provincial body which, um, which, which conducts and manages uh, gaming sites, casinos within Ontario. I also uh, teach a number of topics at Seneca College on the Crime and Intelligence Analysis degree, specifically related to money laundering and organized crime. Previously, I worked for HSBC Bank Canada, so I, I worked in the private sector um, on financial investigations. And as you probably picked up from my accent, I'm not actually from Canada. I'm originally from the United Kingdom, where I was a police officer for just over 10 years, working for the National Crime Agency and its precursor, the Serious Organized Crime Agency, uh, specifically targeting financial crime and money laundering. So what should we be covering in today's session? We'll be looking at uh, what makes a customer high risk. So we often hear this term high risk, so we'll try and unpack a little bit about what that means. We'll look at what uh, Fintrack says about high risk customers in its documentation, in its guidance documents. We'll process for establishing your organization's risk appetite. And then we'll look at some examples of high risk customers, both from a business risk and a relationship risk. And then we'll look at some tools and techniques we can implement in order to manage those customers, those clients who may present a higher risk, but still within your business organization's risk appetite. And then finally, we'll consider the crest consider the question, what do we do when a customer is too high risk or specifically when a customer falls outside of our risk appetite? So firstly, what makes a customer high risk? If we look at business risk factors to begin with, these are the types of products, the types of services which your organization may offer or the exposure that your organizations may have as a result of the way that you do business. For example, products, services, and delivery channels is often the one that uh, is, is most voluminous because here we're talking about mechanisms for conducting transactions. There are many higher risk products and services such as EFTs, electronic cash, the prepayment cards, for example, letter of credits, bank drafts, um, front, front money accounts if you're in the gaming industry. And then if there's any involvement of third party intermediaries or agents, this can also add a layer of complexity and high risk. Private banking. Private banking, it says it in the nature, very much a a very secretive, very exclusive club, often with high net worth individuals. They often attract some additional risk concerns. In terms of delivery channels, using mobile banking, online banking, any of the, the apps that you see connected with, with product offerings, these also present uh, some additional challenges to consider. Then we have issue of geography. So where your, where your business is located or where your clientele is located can potentially um, increase the risk rating of your activities. For example, if, if you are operating uh, near border crossings with high risk jurisdictions or you're operating in a transit point to high risk jurisdictions, you may have, you may have a higher risk if the products and services that are being offered have a nexus to more challenging jurisdictions. You might find that 
when we think of of customers and geography if if you are an organization that has branches or um has customer facing interaction in a, a large city for example where maybe the population is higher where there are more customers coming into your branch or your stores you your branch staff may not may not know the customers as as personally as if potentially you were operating in a more rural environment with maybe a more captive client base where if we go back to the the rose tinted view of of banking in days of old where the bank staff knew the customers that may give you an additional element of comfort you may also find that your customer base your customer base using your organization have connections to high risk jurisdictions conflict zones war zones um, may leverage some of the those higher risk products and services where there's an international dimension and, and that's something that we'll come back to later on new developments and technologies so if if your business is offering a number of these emerging technologies that are really still being developed or they're at the forefront where potentially we haven't fully explored some of the money laundering or the fraud or the risk factors such as virtual currency such as prepayment cards like i mentioned in products and services peer-to-peer -peer transactions can also be challenging and crucially or most challenging is third-party payment processors so if you as an organization are are banking a payment processor the amount of information that your organization would see about those transactions very limited the very the context the kyc the cdd the edd that, that we'll talk about later in this presentation may not be available to you much akin to correspondent correspondent banking for foreign and domestic affiliates is another business risk to consider so if if your organization is international in nature or you have if your organization is part of a group of companies where there are affiliates based in jurisdictions that maybe have a higher risk rating um, maybe have some adverse FATF ratings or again have a customer base that presents additional risks this is something to consider we all remember I'm sure some of the big media stories of recent years where through mer through mergers and acquisitions large organizations merged or acquired smaller outfits in certain jurisdictions in order to expand their international network and subsequently uh, through a lack of due diligence identified that some of the customers some of the compliance practices of those organizations were maybe not in line with their own and finally sanctions directives and national risk assessments so as we'll as we'll cover in a short while uh, san sanctioned individuals can pose a significant risk to your business sanctioned in sanctioned individuals again feed into some of the geography some of the products and service risks that occur here in Canada some of the directives that come out from the Ministry of Finance will impose additional requirements, additional reporting and mitigations on transactions or transactions which may originate from certain countries like Iran and North Korea. And of course, national risk assessments. So the national risk assessment for Canada will also identify specific business and structural risks that will occur um, that should be considered rather for your business here in Canada and through throughout all of these five bullet points the one of the th issues to consider aside from the money laundering risk or the fraud risk is also the reputational risk the front page of the, the Toronto Star test whenever there is a business product or offering that's being being released 
it's always worth thinking how that would look if it appeared on the front page of the newspaper. So moving forward, so we've discussed some of the business risks, briefly touch upon some examples of high risk customers. And as we go through this, when we look at the relationship based risks, we'll explore some of these further. So examples of potentially high risk customers are cash intensive business where there's a level of anonymity involved, money service businesses where again, with a degree of anonymity, but also a international dimension. Politically exposed persons, so individuals that have a PEP designation typically come with a higher risk because they are more exposed to potential bribery and corruption and thus the funds that they may be dealing with uh, present a higher risk. And on that similar vein, international clients are clients with an international footprint. So here we really move into a potential area of tax avoidance slash tax evasion slash, slash money laundering. And uh, those, type of, those type of customers really warrant a little bit more investigation. And that's something which we'll explore um, when we look at our using due diligence as an internal control example. So having talked about what, what are some of the business risks, having given some very brief examples of what um, some potential industries are that are high risk, um, I have on the screen here a uh, copy and paste from, from Fintrack. So if we're talking about what Fintrack says about high risk customers, uh, let's, let's, let's see what the guidance says. Um, specifically, what I'd like to do here is to call out two particular pieces, and I'd like to break these down. So the PCMLTFA and associated regulations do not prohibit you from having high-risk activities or high-risk business relationships. So this bit is key. This is, this is a crux of, of this presentation because there's often an assumption or feeling that high risk means that we can't do business with those individuals. As we saw, or as we talked about from the business risks and the examples of business risks, um, many of those, 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 those things we talked about are used by legitimate customers. They're completely acceptable, normal uh, patterns of behavior or, or transactions, but again, they do present that higher risk. So, how do we how do we deal with with high risk activities and relationships? We have to we have to firstly understand that we have to identify them. We have to to make clear that we are, as an organisation know what is high risk or have an understanding about what is high risk, and then have written policies and procedures to respond to those risks. So specifically, in the second point where I highlight that we must document and implement appropriate controls to mitigate these risks and, and, and apply prescribed special measures. So documentation here is key because when you have a FinTrack examination or, or any other regulatory examination, you, you'll be asked, how do you manage high-risk individuals or high-risk customers? What are, your, what are your written policies and procedures when it comes to high-risk customers' procedures? What, what are your escalation processes? Um, how do you uh, determine what is and what isn't high-risk? And then what mitigation steps do you include? Fintrack kindly give us some examples of the special measures or the enhanced measures that, uh, that we can take. And many of these um, may seem like common sense, and we'll discuss some of them in a short while. For example, adi obtaining additional information on the customer. So really you taking those, those steps of due diligence to fill in the gaps. 
if there are if if you or your compliance teams have questions about it, a client's activity or a customer's activity then obtaining more information can potentially mitigate some of those concerns obtaining information on the client's source of funds and their source of wealth similar but different aspects obtaining information on the reasons that certain transactions are likely to be conducted or attempted to be conducted if they've been blocked for example and thir and and fourthly and and crucially this is really where i'd like to explore today is the statement in fintrax guidance that says any other measures you deem appropriate and this last bit is really key any other measures that you deem appropriate really speaks to the fact that each and every regulated entity will experience their own unique risks and will be will have to respond in ways that are specific to the risks faced for example in if you were were a financial institution taking into account the business risks that we talked about earlier you may have completely different risk factors than a competitor if you were a large organization you may have different a different customer base different product offerings different risks than say a smaller institution like a credit union where the clientele may be a little bit more homogenous or a little bit more domestic now obviously in the title of this presentation we it's called fintrack regulated entities so we're not simply talking about financial institutions here we're talking about any fintrack regulated entity you could be a financial institution a money service bureau you could be a dealer in precious metals you could be a virtual currency operation you could be a gaming and casino operator each of those entities and many others are regulated by fintrack and this is something that is is the same in, in in every other jurisdiction where there is a regulator each and every sector will have their own unique challenges and being able to document and account for those challenges and the responses is key because there really is no there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to dealing with high risk customers but here is the approach to establishing your organization's risk appetite and this is really um, taken from from fintrack this is fintrack's guidance in how to establish your organization's risk appetite and i think as we go through each of these steps um, there will be many factors which which become clear and I think quite quite obvious going forward and many of the things uh, will already be done so the first step is establishing what risks your organization actually faces we're talking about in the inherent risks so the risks that are not risks which simply exist they will be the business-based risks and they'll be the relationship based risks so business-based related to your business activities those products and services which are being offered by your organization the geography that your your business operates in the technologies that your business either operates with or offers service in and again the sanctions and a ministerial directive implications so establishing what risks your business faces but then also uh, secondly establishing the risks linked to your clientele so, and it's it's this relationship based risk assessment where we go a little bit deeper so we're not just simply talking about the, the, your business activities and what your organization offers but it's also how they are utilized by your customers having having established your business risks and your relationship risks next it's important to establish what your risk appetite is or rather your risk tolerance 
what what level of risk is is your organization comfortable with and this is not a simply a compliance question this is a a business whole question what types of knowing there that there are medium risk low risk high risk uh, clients or customers what are, what is your organization comfortable with and again this this will have to be documented accordingly so having identified how much risk you're willing to tolerate in your organization having identified the risks that your business faces you then have to create written policies procedures and strategies in order to mitigate those risks so having identified your high risk population with the high risk products and offerings how do we control or how do we mitigate some of the challenges that they may present having identified having hopefully identified effective ways to mitigate those controls and i use the word mitigate rather than remove because as as i said before there is no one size fits all approach there is no one size fits all customer we can simply make judgments and procedures based on fact and experience and expectations so having identified controls having having implemented controls to try and mitigate the inherent risks faced by your organization we then have to evaluate what's left what is what are rather the residual risks that exist what are the residual potentials that exists for money laundering or terrorist financing or fraud or any other financial crime and this is really when we're thinking about risk reduction and risk mitigation there's always a trade-off between business and compliance step five having identified these things we then implement them we, we implement the controls then we monitor we monitor and we see how effective those controls actually are now we continually have to monitor to see whether those controls are working if the controls don't work or if they're not as effective as intended then rinse and repeat we go back and we modify them so the issue of the the third aspect when it comes to to risk appetite aside from knowing your business risks knowing your relationship risks is also monitoring for those risks as well so monitoring how your strategies are working or not working to mitigate those concerns but also being conscious that risks will risks may change over time as your business changes as new products and services are introduced as new technologies are brought on board as maybe new client new customer populations are onboarded maybe those risks change and being cognizant that those risks may change you have to have a process of refreshing and monitoring your risk assessments but also your the wider business risk tolerance as well may change so the only constant really here that we're talking about is that change will occur and effective monitoring to make sure everything works or everything is working reasonably is key so we've talked about some of the business risks we've talked about how fintrack views high risk we've touched upon some of the examples of sectors that may present higher risk such as cash intensive businesses money service bureaus those with an international footprint but what might these factors that we've talked about from a business perspective look like from a relationship perspective how how might these risks present themselves in a customer relationship or a customer transaction so if we think about product services and delivery channels we talked earlier about the use of EFTs and the use of electronic cash and the use 
of intermediaries and third parties. Now, if you had a customer, for example, that had a, vo a high volume of in and out transactions, you had um, you know, a lot of EFTs in, a lot of EFTs out in quick succession. Maybe you have, maybe your client has a number of third parties that are, are um, involved in these transactions. That would potentially present a high risk that would need explaining. Essentially, what what is the purpose of this account? If additionally you were seeing a lot of these transactions were were being conducted electronically and being being used through mobile or online banking, again something some things to think about when compared with face to face operations. Question of geography. So if you have if you have a a customer base that is conducting transactions which are potentially far, far outside of their their um, place of residence or their their area of, of location that could potentially raise questions the question to ask is where are the transactions being conducted so we talked earlier in the in when we looked at business risks we talked about how there are high risk jurisdictions or there uh, there are areas that surround high risk jurisdictions do you have a customer who is transacting with those countries or with the surrounding countries for transit points are we bringing potentially issues of terrorist financing or the, or the funding of terrorism into this but again always really bearing in mind that there are many legitimate reasons there are many customers who have completely expected or legitimate connections to high-risk jurisdictions. So context is always key. The important thing here when we're, look, when we're looking at, at all of these relationship factors is to understand what is expected behavior and what is unusual behavior. And that's something that we will cover in the next slide. New developments in technologies. So, you know, how how are how are new technologies being used by the customer? Are you seeing a customer that is using your accounts or your services to further use virtual currencies or to deal in high-risk items such as precious gems, diamonds, metals? You know, are you seeing are you seeing your accounts potentially being used? for flow through or as another layer foreign and domestic affiliates you know if you if you are from an organization that has an international footprint where your clients are utilizing international services either from your, from your own offerings or from third parties does the international the international activity make sense does the international activity fit with your expectations? And then finally, sanctions, directives, and risk assessments. So, as part of your process, as part of your your KYC and CDD processes that we'll talk about next, does your customer appear in any adverse media? Do they appear on a sanctions list? Do they come from a jurisdiction that is subject of a ministerial directive? Are there any additional risks that are documented in a national risk assessment, for example? Just just some things to think about from a relationship perspective. Now, having identified the risks, having identified some of the potential risks paced, paced, uh, faced rather by your, your clientele, um, how can we manage this risk? And from a relationship perspective, KYC, CDD, and EDD are really key. Very much knowing who your customer is and appreciating that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to this. You should essentially know as much about a customer as you need to to manage that risk.
if we think about typical KYC or CDD, we confirm for low level risks, confirming the identity of a customer, confirming their name, their date of birth, their address, maybe you're checking credit file, you're identifying that they're low risk. That's potentially the extent of the steps you would take. If you encounter a high risk individual or someone that through your risk rating potentially is high risk, then you may want to take that step further and do enhanced due diligence. And this is really where we start to explore a little bit more about who the client is. What are their source of funds? What is, what's their source of, of wealth? Again, keeping source of funds and source of wealth different. What is the expected activity for the, for the account? Or what is the expected activity of, your, of the services being provided by your organization? First question is to ask, having 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 appreciate having been given the answer to what the expected activity is does that activity fall within your risk appetite but then secondly as part of your ongoing monitoring is there a disconnect between the actual activity that you're observing maybe through transaction monitoring or other compliance activities versus what is anticipated has, has the client told you one thing and is doing another? And of course, there's always a wide range of bespoke, individually tailored questions that you can ask a customer in order to satisfy your understanding. When we talk about KYC, CDD, EDD, this is a ongoing monitoring. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. So CDD and EDD should, should automatically be reviewed on a periodic basis, depending on the level of risk that your customer is rated as. But it can also be subject to review or refresh following a investigation by your AML team or your compliance team, uh, the filing of an STR, for example, if there's, if there's a risk that's been identified it's always worth exploring whether that risk could potentially be mitigated by more information. Is Was there information that had we known, we might have alleviated some of the reasonable grounds to suspect money laundering? These controls I mentioned here, really focusing on the individual customer level. But if we're going, if you're dealing with commercial entities, commercial clients, there's a whole other wealth of information that you may collect or you should collect when it comes to understanding your customer. One of the common ones is, what is the expect, expected instrument of transaction? What is the expected cash volumes? What are the expected checks, drafts? What is, or rather, what is the nature of the nature of transactions are you uh, it, is this a commercial customer that is a, a domestic based customer will there be international transactions for example where does the commercial company or the uh, or the entity operate uh, who are the beneficial owners of the company and ultimately at, at the highest level what does the company do is the comp does the company's nature of business fall within your risk appetite and crucially can this information be verified throughout my career I've had a number of, of instances where there's been a commercial entity that has that has disclosed their nature of business as one thing but then through external research through adverse media searches it turns out quite frankly they're operating in a completely different nature of business. And this can be um, certainly a red flag when it comes to um, the risk. If, if you identify that a customer is being deceitful or is maybe not providing full information, then again, 
it's worth considering whether that is normal or reasonable behavior. Aside from relationship-based trans based controls, there's also transaction-based controls that we can implement. And this, these controls can be specific to an individual customer's risk. Again, thinking about products, services, delivery channels, geography, and the other business and relationship risks that we talked about. You could, for example, require that certain transactions have to be approved by management before they can be conducted. Maybe there's certain products and services that may not be available to a customer unless they have gone through certain enhanced due diligence or additional due diligence for specific transactions. On the other side, you may have real-time approval. So if, if your organization has identified that there's certain business risks with certain products or certain customers, you may specify that if a customer tries to conduct this type of transaction, um, that transaction would not be completed until uh, approved by management. This, this real-time approval is most commonly used when we're talking about international wires. So if, if a customer tries to make an international wire, um, has entered the beneficiary details into the wire transfer, um, maybe there's there's some some transaction monitoring that has identified this wire to be worthy of further review. That wire or that transaction could be held until further questions are asked. There could be limits placed on transactions. So these are individually tailored limits as to what uh, what is allowed. One of the, the most common one here is the interact daily limits. So a customer may have a certain daily limit, a different customer may have another. Uh, hold periods for checks and, and drafts, for example. Some, some customers may have to, have to wait for their remaining funds until the check is cleared. Other customers who may present a lower risk may be availed of the, of the funds straight away. Or, or simply, there could be blanket restrictions. Blanket restrictions on transactions of a certain type. Uh, many financial institutions place limits, sorry, uh, restrictions or, or bans on customers dealing with entities in the cannabis industry or virtual currencies or arms dealers or any kind of sector that falls outside of their risk appetite. And again, this is a business risk decision that's identified when we think about our, our establishing our, our organization's risk appetite, established during the identifying the risk tolerance phase. So having identified that potentially you have a high risk client or high risk patron, what do you do? So of course, any customer that you have or that you want to have must fall within your risk appetite. If the residual risks fall outside of the risk appetite, then it's time to take further steps, up, up to and including terminating the relationship. But before we do that, we must, we must also bear in mind that customer circumstances, customer details can change over time. So making sure that what you know about the customer is up to date. So making sure that your, C, your, your KYC and your CDD or your EDD is up to date and is, is indeed a true reflection so that potentially some of these activities that have fallen outside of the anticipated activities um, may indeed be newly anticipated. You know, if you think, if you take an example, if, if you had KYC that stated that your customer was a student, for example, and then you suddenly see thousands of dollars worth of, 
worth of transactions, spending, international transactions. That may raise some questions. You know, is that activity in line with the student? It potentially may present too much risk. But then, you know, as you're looking at this this customer, you identify that your KYC is is out of is is aged. It's it, it's it's several years old. So reaching out. So you, reaching out to the customer for a, a refresh identifies that they've graduated university and they've they've struck it big and they've founded the next IT company or the, they've launched the the next smartphone app and they're actually they actually have a different profile. So making sure that the information that we know about the customer is up to date can potentially mitigate some of the risks if if the disconnect has been identified or if we've been able to clarify any misunderstandings or mismatches between expectations and reality but then if we can't do that if we can't mitigate the risks we have to consider the relationship as a whole or firstly the serv the, the products and services that are being offered is it possible again like we talked about in the transaction-based controls, is it possible to put limits or restrictions on a customer using certain products and services which may allow the customer to fall back into your risk tolerance? But then simply, if there is no way to bring that customer back within your risk tolerance, then you must reconsider, or you should reconsider whether that relationship can be maintained. Because if, if that relationship falls outside of your documented risk tolerance, um, you would have to be able to articulate what is the exception to this individual. What, how, how, how can we justify maintaining the relationship of this customer when they clearly fall outside of what we're willing to accept in our risk tolerance. So in summary, the PCML TFA and, and, and associated, associated regulations don't prevent us from dealing with high-risk customers. We simply have to take steps in order to control those high risks, to manage those high risks, and to take a, a customer focused approach, a, a bespoke customer focused approach in order to manage those risks. Obviously if if someone does fall outside of the of our our risk tolerances then we have to maybe reconsider um, that relationship. If if controls don't mitigate the risks then the ultimate control that you can take is demarketing or discontinuing the relationship. So on that note, I'd like to move into the question phase. And uh, I do see we have a number of questions in the, uh, the chat box already. So um, feel free to continue to add to that uh, chat box as I, as I will read through them. But first question, is diligence is due diligence the same as having proof? So obviously we've talked about EDD, CDD, KYC, where we are obtaining documents, we're making risk ratings for our clients. Do we need proof? Now, we're, we're operating in a, a risk-based uh, environment. We can make risk we can make a risk rating based on information provided to us um, so we have an, un an understanding of the client but it's not practical to have or not feasible to have proof of source of funds or source of wealth for every single transaction we have to take a holistic approach another question I, I, I like this question. What should entities do if a customer refuses to provide information? 
So when we looked at when we looked at the question there about relationship based controls and raising bespoke or individually tailored questions to individual clients in order to get information related to the concerns that we have. Um, the customer is under no uh, legal obligation to provide information or to answer a question. Um, you know, if you're a pri if you're if we're a private entity, there's no subpoena power or there's no power to compel. But if if the customer refuses to provide information, then you have to make make a judge. You have to make a judgment based on the information that you have, both based on the information that you have, but also it's worth considering the reason potentially why a customer has refused or is unable to provide information. Ultimately, in our environment, when we're making risk-based approaches, we, we, we make our decisions based on the information available to us. Another question here. Do entities need to have proof of money laundering before implementing further diligence or internal controls? Again, no. If we think about in our world when, we do, when we're, we're thinking about money laundering and we're thinking about the filing of STRs and having, having reasonable grounds to suspect, um, we certainly don't we working in a financial institution or working in any other regulated entity, we only see a very thin slice of a customer's financial activities. It's very difficult for us to draw conclusions which are, which are evidential or rising to the standard of proof. But if you have risk indicators or you have suggestions that um, a customer is presenting a risk or a higher risk or has potentially moved risk categories. Maybe they've, they've changed their behavior and they're now involved or they're utilizing different products and services. Then you should indeed re-risk or revisit their, uh, their rating. Um, question here, at what point is due diligence not enough? I think, frankly, if if we if you're unable to to mitigate the concerns that you have or the or the risks that the client poses through any of the relationship or transaction-based controls, if you're if you're not able to satisfy that the the client or the customer has 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 come back into your risk tolerance, then that would be the point where uh, you have to reconsider the relationship. You also have to consider, you know, if you have a very unique or a very challenging client, um, and this is more of a business um, response rather than a, a compliance or an AML response, but if you have a customer or a client that needs a lot of due diligence, maybe there's a lot of lengthy information requests, um, if there's a lot of information that's required, then um, the business may have to may make a decision themselves that the reward for all this effort is simply not worth it. Um, that's all the question. That's all the questions uh, that we have time for. Unfortunately, um, there was a number of other questions, but uh, I'm more than happy to answer those um, offline. But um, again, thank thanks for your for your time. I, I know we're getting on to towards lunchtime now, but hopefully, hopefully through this presentation, you've seen that um, high risk does not mean that we can't do business with clients. We just have to make sure that we have appropriate internal controls to mitigate the risk and make sure that we're, those customers are within our prescribed risk tolerance. I suppose my final takeaway point would be when it comes to thinking about what type of internal controls, what type of mitigants to introduce, really nothing's off the table. It's, it's whatever you and your organization can think of in order to mitigate 
the risks presented in front of you. Um, so thank you for your time. And as, as, as with many of these sessions, the views expressed on my own are and, uh, not indicative of uh, Ontario Lottery and Gaming. On that note, I'll hand it back over to Andrew.